I really like the, uh, the Manu volatility indicator, at least for psych psychology. I don't know. It helps me a lot. All right, Christopher Lundy. Everyone knows you on fractal intelligence. You don't really need any introduction. I'm just going to give you the floor, put myself on mute, and uh, let you have the floor, buddy. Yeah, Matt, thank you so much for having me on as a guest speaker. Um, you know, it's really humbling to be a part of this group and to be a part of this community. And the reason for me is very simple is that I came from, you know, n nowhere in the crypto space. I came into this process out of nowhere. I did not know what I was doing. I did not know what I was getting myself into. And Fractal Intelligence was actually one of the first crypto groups that I joined. And uh, as a result of joining this group, I went from being a noob that didn't know how to do a simple uh, exchange swap to having my own business advising clients, including high net worth clients. So I'm very thankful uh, to be in this space because it is truly revolutionary. It is uh, a movement of the people and is a way that we reclaim our sovereignty, our health and our freedom. And you cannot have one without the other two. They are symbiotically linked but you have to do it in the correct order or interesting things will happen. And for those of you that don't know me well, my name is Christopher Lundy. I'm 42 years old. I was born in Albuquerque, New Mexico in 1979 uh, to my mother, Susan, and my father, John. And uh, both of my parents are deceased. Uh, my father died of the inoculation. My mother died of cancer in 2005. So I am without a family in my immediate vicinity. Uh, many generations have passed on rapidly over the course of the last 20 years. So I, I had to find a new community. I had to find a new place to be because within my family, there was a large number of people that were very set in their ways, very, you know, shall we say, uninterested in thinking outside of the box or even considering what my story was whenever I had a chance to tell it to them when I was young. <coughs> And the story begins for us in 1990. August 1990, my mother divorces my stepfather, whose name is Freddie Ray May. So yeah, he's got two out of three first names. So yeah, real winner, that one. <laughs> and uh, th this guy was a technologist. He was a provider, but he was not a good guy. And uh, he was very violent. He actually con convinced my mother that I was sneaking into the kitchen to steal peanut butter, which I vehemently hated eating because it it, it tasted like toxic waste to me, and uh, <laughs> it, which was very unusual, but he was very coercive and very convincing with his aggressive behavior. Um, so in from 1989 through 1990, from the ages of 10 to 11, I was basically a prisoner in my own home. He convinced my mother to put burglar alarms on my bedroom door and both of my bedroom windows. So I've been in lockdown most of my life, ladies and gentlemen. I've known what coercive control is because I experienced it inside of my own home before I was even, before I even hit puberty. I had no chance to really be a kid because everyone wanted control persistently. And that was the operative phrase that was going to become much more loud in the subsequent years. When I got to August, 1990, my mother packed in everything and drove us across the country into a dusty rat hole town in southeastern Colorado called Springfield. It's in Baca County. And those of you that have lived in Colorado or live in Colorado potentially on this phone call, Baca County, Colorado is a wasteland. It was uh, heavily hit during the Dust Bowl and was basically filled with nothing but ghost towns from the 1930s up until probably after World War II. And it was mostly agricultural, very small communities, and very uh, police-based. Lots of people that were career police people and sheriff's people. Apparently, that was the best paying gig in town. So I get there, and uh, one thing happens, and another thing happens. But the long and short of it was I was confronted by a schoolyard bully. And that schoolyard bully decided that it was a good idea to push my face into the ground uh, or into a water fountain while I was taking a drink uh, and run and, and uh, say, uh, uh, come and get this new boy. So I was like, sure thing. I, I ran outside. I took him by the head and I slammed his face directly into the, into some concrete stairs. 
I kicked him in the face as hard as I could. I punched him as hard as I could until he was unconscious. And I got raucous applause from at least 50 people at that school, 50 children, because this guy was bullying at least 50 of the kids at the school. And I wiped his ass out, made sure that he never touched me again because I just got done be getting the shit kicked out of me for two straight years. And I was ready to go. I was ready to declare parabellum sacrum against these people. And for those of you that don't know what parabellum sacrum means, declaration of holy war. I was ready to kill at the age of 11 years old. I was so filled with rage. I had no hope for the future. I was completely removed from my family on the side of a highway 10 miles away from a rat hole town. And I was in complete despair at a very young age. And that led to me acting out. And that got the attention of the authorities. Whenever you hospitalize a kid whose family is a prominent family within the community, you're going to create some attention from law enforcement. And, uh, Initially, nothing happened to me because I was defending myself from a bully, but I did get sent to detention for two weeks where I was in order to write a book report on George Washington, which was apparently enshrined in the in the <laughs> in, in the school's like Hall of Fame uh, essays. Interestingly, I plagiarized it word for word. <laughs> so I basically made a mockery of their system by plagiarizing what they asked me to write. So uh, uh, I just like, you know, this isn't education. This is all a joke. It's like you know, civics and you know, people from bygone eras. It's like, teach me something that I can use to actually improve my life and introduce me to people that are warm and loving. It wasn't there to be had. It was a very cold, distant, uh, mistrustful community that did not have a, a good vibe about it. And in November of, two, of 1990, I was invited to a friend of mine's house to play Super Mario Brothers or something. And, uh, and I love playing video games. It was my escape from reality. It was a way for me to kind of channel my focus into something that was skill-based so that I could win some competitions without getting into fights with people. You know, I wanted to have more than one skill, but, you know, what can you do? I go upstairs after uh, banging out Mario, and uh, I see two sheriff's deputies and my mother bawling her eyes out, signing uh, some commitment papers. She did not know what she was signing, and I begged her to stop signing the paper, throw it up, and burn it. But she was signed it under duress and coercion, and that was the beginning of a six-year legal battle. And the first words out of the sheriff's mouth is, are we going to have a problem, or do I have to cuff you? And I started bawling. I started screaming. I was like, what are you doing? And in the middle of the night at 11.30 p.m. on November 27, 1990, I was whisked away into the back of a police car and driven in the middle of the night to a remote location somewhere in the mountains where I was interrogated. I'm not going to repeat what was done during their interrogation because I don't want people to completely lose their shit. Uh, after the interrogation was complete, I was transported into Pueblo, Colorado. And uh, after arriving, I went immediately into a lockdown ward of like a, a regional medical center. The first thing that happened to me after I arrived is they put hooked me up to a brain scanner and put me on Prozac and Thorazine, no questions asked. And if I didn't take them, then I was going to get thrown into solitary confinement for 14 days. And if you went into that room, it reeked of urine and feces. It hadn't been cleaned in years. It was a very hazardous and unhealthy environment. I was there for two weeks, and then I was transferred to Colorado Mental Health Institute at Pueblo. I had two different stints there, 1990 to 1991 and 1992 to 1993. I was, I had about a six month reprieve, well, six to eight months living with my father, which was very traumatic because my father was a very abusive man and uh, was not a very friendly person to be around and didn't, you know, di didn't really have a lot of divine masculine qualities to him. He just wanted to smoke pot and, you know, you know, drink beer and, you know, yell at people. He was a, he was a real winner, that one. Uh, but, um, uh, and I, I got a very negative attitude towards cannabis at the time because I associated it with my father's belligerent behavior and angry outbursts. I just couldn't understand how something that's supposed to relax people would turn them into such monsters to their own family members. So after I got out of that situation, I was devastated because I didn't really want to leave, but I hated school. Um, and for me, the breaking point was when I, uh, I just didn't know how to take care of myself. I wasn't good at self-care. I hid from the world most of the time. I played video games all the time. I could not, for the life of me, face reality because I did not, under any circumstances, want to be a part of it. 
because I found it to just be absolutely unbearable because everybody and their brother wanted to have control over my life without providing me with any love, guidance, or skill building. Everything was all about putting me in my place. And that continued for the following four years. Um, and interestingly, in 1992, late that year, I became attractive to the opposite sex and I got my you know, got myself touched in a, a way that I was not accustomed to being touched for the first time at the age of 13. And it was very confusing for me to be engaged in these types of uh, sexual interplays with, uh, with, peop with, with, with young girls at this young age while being imprisoned because how can you, you can't be intimate. You can't like go out for, for a soda. You can't go to a drive-in movie theater, which still existed plentifully back then. You can't go to a show or a concert, you know, and it was a great time to go to concerts because it was like in the middle of Nirvana and Smashing Pumpkins heyday. And those concerts were powerful and energetic and rebellious. And when those, when that music came out, that was really the first piece of music that was like, these people are fucking badass. They are going hard against these fucks. And I was like, wow, this is really cool. It's really cool to see this movement and, you know, seeing Red Hot Chili Peppers play Give It Away on MTV and all these other popular culture things. You know, I became very entranced by that and by fantasy novels. So I started reading Tolkien. I started re reading, you know, the, you know, the Witcher novel series. I, I read, I, I read uh, a lot of different uh, novel series uh, and that's all I did was I read, I created my own RPG, like turn-based board games anything that I could do to create another reality. Uh, I didn't keep any of it because it's been long since gone. But the, this woman that touched me, this, that, that is now a woman somewhere in this world, her name was Lisa. And she wrote me a letter before I received my first kiss from a girl. She kissed me as soon as she gave me this. And this, here's what she said. Chris, hey, how's life? Cool here, and thanks for the letter. It made me smile. Not a fake smile to flash to the staff members, but a real one. You know, you're really sweet. You're a cool guy. When it came through, I thought this place was for crazy people. But we're all crazy inside, and that's what makes us smile. You have a really sweet personality. Keep making me feel better. You sure managed to cheer me up all the time. And why are you here? You don't have to tell me. I know we met before, though at the mall, at a party anyway. I met you before, got a jet, keep making people smile. Peace emoji, right arrow emoji, heart emoji, you lots by, friends forever, Lisa, male insignia, female insignia. Peace and love to you lots by. Stay cool, hot or warm, just stay. The next day, the next day Lisa disappeared after she refused to take her medication. I never saw her again. It was the most devastating moment in my life at that point. She was such a sweet young girl. And no one would say where she went, except to say that she went to a more secure facility. I never heard from her again. I've kept this letter ever since. I thought I lost it once or twice, but I still have it today. As a reminder that love matters, no matter where it comes from. Ladies and gentlemen, we've spent most of our adult lives in this community reading books about the Soviet Union, the Gulag Archipelago, the Red Wheel, etc. Okay. This same Gulag Archipelago and Red Wheel has existed in the United States for decades and decades and decades. It has never gone away. Ever. This was all a plan. And in 1993, I was put into Colorado Mental Health Institute's lockdown war. The first thing they do in the lockdown war is they put you in solitary confinement for 14 days. If you act out once, they add 14 more days on. If you act out again... They put you in a solitary confinement space indefinitely, forever. And those that continue to act out are drugged heavily. Also reported to child protective, or not child protective services, but the, uh, you know, the the family courts, as being, you know, crazy. And then they end up committed for the rest of their life as guinea pigs for big pharma. All the stories you hear about crazy people going in here, they're not crazy. 
they're human trafficking victims and they demonize the very victims that they're victimizing. Does that sound familiar? Israel bombing Gaza, for example. Same people, same Zionist establishment that wants to drug children in an effort to poison them yeah. as well as Matt Matt, are you trying to interject? I see you're unmuted. No, no, I'm just agreeing with you because it's like it's rare that someone knows that, that, that deeply that this cult, you know, basically follows the Talmud, not the Torah, and it's a sect within a sect, and they are like a banking occult. So yeah, yeah they're and, you know, the in pharmacia, you know, the, the insignia of pharmacia is a snake wrapped around a maypole. Uh, or something similar to this snake around the maypole is on the uh, sigil of Baphomet. Okay. So all the symbolism is hidden in plain sight everywhere in the world. And I didn't really try to make sense of it because I wasn't in a position to defend myself and I wasn't in a position to refuse. After I got out of the lockdown ward, uh, solitary confinement section, I was put into the solitary confinement ward because a different girl other than Lisa came up to me and kissed me and touched me and I reciprocated and she said no. And then they, and then I got thrown into the lockdown ward. I couldn't even begin to express love physically or otherwise, because one, I didn't know what I was doing. And two, I didn't really have a frame of reference because anytime I tried, I would get thrown into the brick. It was the only co-educational, so to speak facility I was in during my time while I was imprisoned and I didn't see another girl my age until I was 17 years old afterwards. So I had spent four years of my teenage life without any access to, to girls my age, which was extremely uh, devastating to my personal development as a, as a man later in life because I didn't get to see the innocence, you know, didn't, didn't get to see what comes before the harm. Fast forward to 1996. I'm not going to go over everything that happened in El Pueblo Boys Ranch, but that was the next place I went. The previous years involved me building bike trail in the in the uh, in the mountains in the San Luis Valley, the north and southern parts of the valley. I joined 4-H. I did a lot of productive things, but the place was still a prison. And if you left, they would throw you in a juvenile detention center where you would stay until the age of 18. They did everything that they could to make sure that they maintained you under control. And from 1993 to 1995, I was forced to wear a white jumpsuit. And I was also walked around in public in this jumpsuit as a way to shame me in the event that I ever tried to leave with it. They did that to basically parade the children to the surrounding community and say, hey, these people are delinquents. And if you see them, call the police. The whole thing was a fear and control based exercise. It had absolutely nothing to do with us walking around to stay healthy. It was all about your hours now, no matter what. And I was forced to write journal entries about my quote unquote experiences, but they were all compelled. And one time I, I was told to write a more violent journal entry. I was like, okay, so you're basically telling me to cook you up a little, uh, you know, HP Lovecraft story. Want me to throw a uh, Beetlejuice in there for you too? The dude was kind of chubby, so I called him a fat ass. It's like, while I'm outside working out, you're in here stuffing your face with uh, donuts and and uh, and and cheese grits. Like, what, what the fuck is your problem, asshole? You know, that was basically my response to him. And uh, it's like, well, we can always put you back in the white jumpsuit, you know, or, or you can always, you know, just eat another donut and shut your mouth. That was the uh, the response I got, and eventually just kind of gave up because everyone was laughing at him. Because that's when I started getting a rebellious spirit. And then I went to court and I told them I was I was ordered under duress and coercion to write this. So it's inadmissible by definition. It's in violation of my Fifth Amendment constitutional rights, my First Amendment constitutional rights. It's inadmissible. And I screamed at my guardian at light. I'm outside the courtroom. If you do not stand up for me here, I'm going to petition the court to have you removed from your position because you're acting in bad faith. And of course they did nothing. So I had to speak up for myself and I didn't know legal processes. So I had to appeal to the judge's emotions. So I made a collage for the judge and uh, the collage for the judge was uh, a picture of uh, the early days of the Balkan wars. And in the early days of the Balkan wars, there was a large amount of uh, human trafficking that took place on long train routes. And on these long train routes, children from Bosnia, Children from uh, Sar you know, you know, whether they were from Sarajevo, whether they were from, you know, uh, 
it didn't matter where they were from, but uh, Eastern Europe is a large hub of human trafficking uh, to and from Israel, especially. And there's a picture in the National Geographic of a child screaming with a large stack of uh, European currency, I believe it was Swiss francs, dropped on top of his lap. And I handed that to the judge and I wrote a caption. Every nightmare has an end. And I looked at the judge and said, I do not want this to be my end. I expect you to put an end to this. He ruled in my favor. And a perjury ruling under contempt of court was issued. And El Pueblo Boys Ranch was ordered to release me to the care of my mother until another judge intervened to put me into another placement in the state of Kentucky after I returned to the state of Kentucky called Buckhorn Children's Center, which was pretty innocuous. They weren't problematic people. They were just rednecks that liked to smoke and uh, watch wrestling. They didn't care what we did. Yeah. And uh, I made money by lo mowing lawns. I practiced my guitar, playing Alice in Chains, playing Smashing Pumpkins, playing all the, the angst-ridden 1990s, you know, uh, grunge teen kind of thing, which was really educational for me. And uh, that's where I got my first licks in. And after I graduated from high school, well, I graduated from public high school. I spent one year in a public high school playing catch up and got out and then uh, entered college about a year later after taking a year off. I went up to Seattle for a year and just, uh, I hung out in uh, Ballard and lower Fremont a lot. You know, I hang around, you know, I, I smoked pot for the first time. And uh, I learned how to play Hunger Strike with some friends that I met in uh, Discovery Park, which was really cool because that's where the Hunger Strike video was filmed. And I got to go to the same spot about eight years after that video was filmed. And uh, we played the song. We looked out on the same lighthouse and looked out into the bay. And I belted out a really nice vocal. It was just a beautiful moment. And, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of hippie chicks there that was just really sweet, you know, gentle, loving people from all walks of life. It was really a wonderful place to be in a wonderful time. And when I got into college, you know, I was like, you know what? Uh, this is the direction I want my life to go in. This is how I heal, at least for now, you know. And I got into college and I realized that uh, when I got there, it was just all communist propaganda. I go into Western traditions class where we're sudden, where we're talking about Martin Luther, uh, specifically the essay on uh, it's called On the Jews and Their Lies. And uh, suddenly the guy is pivoting into encouraging people to work hard by paying them next to nothing. What do you guys think about that? And my answer was, that sounds like slavery. Do you, uh, are you okay with slavery? Do you think Martin Luther King's a bad guy? And just kind of mocking him. It's like, do you think people should be chained up and paid one cent a day? You know? So like, and, uh, and I was just furious at him and I dropped the course immediately and I went to the dean. It's like, is this a school or a fucking indoctrination camp? Because I've already been in camps and it's not a fun experience. Okay, I'm going to change. I'm going to switch this course. It's like, well, you're going to get failed. It's like, do you think I care if I fail a course where I'm being propagandized with communism? I should sue you people. This is an education. I'm sure, pretty sure it's in violation of quite a few laws. So I dropped out of college in 2000. I had enough. I played all the piano I could. I played all the classical guitar I could. I learned how to play a uh, few release on, on classical guitar, which was one of my greatest achievements. It's a very hard song to play. Uh, and and uh, also learned how to play Moonlight Sonata and all the great classic uh, Baroque era tunes that you, you know, drift away to whenever you're stargazing. That was really how I wanted to live my life, adrift in a float in the sky with beautiful tones to carry me away. And after I dropped out, I was like, you know, I'll just kind of cut my teeth a little bit, start working. So I did and uh, moved to Tennessee for a couple of years. Didn't like it. 9-11 hit, came back to Kentucky, and then eventually went to Atlanta, Georgia in 2003. And uh, in, in Atlanta is where I joined my first band called Red Square, which is ironically, which ironically used communist energy. <laughs> I was just like, fuck it. You know, I, I want to join a band and it's a friend from high school and we're really close. And uh, we, uh, we always used to, to, to make fun of my friend, Danny. Uh, we used to call him, a, I used to call him a chimpanzee with a blonde wig on because he's a little chubby and he liked to play his uh, guitar behind his head and uh, 
had ridiculously over accentuated blonde hair and uh you know and uh you know sometimes uh you know he he would talk about it's like guys i just really love to bleach my pants because i i, I want to look hot it's like dude we're not talking about you know pants where you're talking about it's like it's like he's just really full of himself which is kind of funny because he's a little plump you know so it's like dude your hair is just it's glorious like clorox bleach it's really great you know so it, it's just great you know shooting the breeze discovering all this underground black metal and that's when i really started going hard because the rage came back when i was in atlanta i saw you know kind of the the the, the, the pepperings of multiculturalism and the violence and the drive-by shootings like you know what i'm pissed off and I know who's responsible for this, and they're called Zionists. I was red pilled on them from day one, pretty much when I was a kid, and uh, so I started getting into national socialist black metal and extreme far right ideologies. I was very attracted to it because I perceived this as a legitimate resistance movement to crush the Zionist establishment. I did not realize at the time that the Nazis were funded by the Rothschilds, and in many cases had many Jewish generals amongst their ranks, and. Uh, so I so I started listening to bands like Graveland and Nocturnal Mortem and uh, you know uh, Blasphemy and Grave, you know, it, you know and, I, and it was extremely violent music. Like you know the the subject matter was you know <laughs> it was not for the faint of heart. It was basically misanthropic, society destroying music. I wore corpse paint, and corpse paint for those that aren't familiar has uh, a, a symbolic meaning. Uh, in Norse mythology, there is uh, uh, a, 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 a an ethereal warrior class called the Osgards Rai, uh, warriors of Osgard, that come down uh, during the, uh, the the Battle of Ganungagap, which is basically Armageddon, the end of the world, to purge the world of corruption. And uh, we considered Christianity and Satanism and anything that was essentially of Zionist or Khazarian mafia origin as as the target. And it was all metaphoric and symbolic, but if it really came down to it, we were ready to take up arms. You know, so uh, we, I had a lot of friends within the community that were sympathetic with this context. A lot of them came from Northern and Eastern Europe. Uh, I had a lot of friends from Ukraine, a lot of friends from Russia, a lot of friends from Norway, a lot of friends from Germany. You know, so I surrounded myself with people of like-minded contexts, uh, mainly because I thought the United States was going to collapse and I needed big, brawny, strong people that knew how to shoot straight, aim small and miss small in case the shit hit the fan. And that was really my pledge to life. It's like when the war comes, I am ready to take him down. Uh, I had no hope for my life. I just had hope to, you know, purge the country of this horrible corruption that had come to consume it and was moving in for the kill in 2008 and that's when i thought it was all over uh but uh after that you know i i, I met a woman who ironically I did, I did not know at the time was jewish and uh we ended up uh into a relationship that produced my daughter my daughter's name is uh seven saint Clair, and uh, i had no no voice in naming her i wanted to name her olivia lundy uh, olivia riley lundy that was the name I wanted to give her. I have not seen my baby since she was one month old. Our uh, relationship was very frac uh, uh, fractured because she gave me a book about astrology and about divine promise and divine timing and left me a note with a little cute, you know, scribble on it after we met. We were very young. We were in our mid twenties, and I met her immediately after my mother died. So I was starved for affection. I was absolutely unable to function, and um, so I basically dove headfirst into this woman's arms, without realizing that it was the biggest mistake in my life. Almost immediately afterwards, you know, there was a lot of abuse hurled. We didn't know how to heal ourselves, and we were trying to heal each other. It was a classic trauma trauma bonding situation. And that trauma bond led to me being on the uh, child support plantation. And I've been on that plantation since 2007. And uh, I ended up leaving Atlanta after losing my job. And I went to go live in an apartment next to where my mother used to live. And for years, I just kind of stared out into space and was like, I guess I'll just work a job and try to stay alive and maybe try to leave the United States. And uh, then I ended up leaving Kentucky 
and moving a lot. After I lost my job in 2010, I used to work in a, a hospital uh, and I worked in a hospital during the swine flu hoax. And I warned everybody that uh, this hoax was going to be used as an excuse to declare martial law. I red pilled people on Operation Dark Winter. I reminded people about the anthrax attacks. I reminded them about how the swine flu vaccine in the 1970s uh, you know, caused Guillain-Barre syndrome, severe neurological disorders, and killed and maimed you know, enough people uh, to stop it. And uh, you know, in a lot of ways, my, my advice was ignored. And... Uh, I got to a point of where I knew that uh, I couldn't stay there anymore. And eventually they framed me, set me up and uh, uh, gently fired me. I was out of work for a year and uh, I bought a shitload of gold and silver in between. And it was 2009, 2010. I, I, I found out about Bitcoin. I didn't invest in it because I thought it was a cashless society Trojan horse. And I just kept stacking silver. I bought all the silver I could get, and I managed to build a sack of about $60,000 worth of silver and gold on a salary of $60,000 a year. <laughs> and that salary of $60,000 a year was with overtime. I worked 100-hour weeks busting my ass to stack silver as much as I could because I knew at some point I was going to have to extricate myself from this toxic environment, and I did. And a year later, I did get another job, and it was just like bouncing from jobs to jobs to jobs, getting back to Atlanta, meeting people. And then eventually in 2020, COVID hits. And this is where we get to the relevant part of the story. And this is where this shift starts, right? This is where I start using Telegram. This is where I start doing research on cryptocurrencies. And I'm like, I got all the silver and I was just buying silver, 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 silver. I was just of the same mind I was in back in, you know, 2008. I just wanted to buy silver, silver, silver. That was it. So I did that and I, uh, I read about Theta and then I started reading about uh, that and Theta Fuel. It's like, okay, this will be the first project I get in. And I was intrigued by Bix Weir because I read a lot of his essays on gold and silver markets in 2008 and 2009. But a lot of those predictions ended up not coming true. So I figured it was like, okay, this guy is a, a talented writer, but uh, his head is not really in a, a space of reality in terms of the actual timing of how these market movements are going to work. So yeah, that $5,000 silver, I'm still waiting for it. Uh, but, uh, you know, in terms of relevance, you know, there's so many things that uh, are needed, you know. And I didn't know during this entire time of struggle, during this entire time of hardship, that um, I had cancer. I looked at a picture of myself recently from 1982. I'm sitting in a chair and I'm holding a yellow football. And I'm smiling ear to ear. I, the picture was taken at uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico's Walmart, which was uh, over by Sandia Crest. It was like right by the mountains over near the ski lift and all that fun stuff. And that's where I was living at the time. It's really nice, you know, going up to going up the ski lift and uh, using that as kind of like your playpen uh, and seeing all the, you know, all, all the ancient seashells on the side of the rocks. Uh, but, uh, you know, there was uh, so many triggers in that moment because I noticed that I had a problem in 2017 when I started uh, developing lesions. But initially, I thought that I had uh, um, a bacterial infection and I cleared it with Nystatin and then I was fine. And then things got progressively worse and worse and worse. I started getting more lesions. I started having uh, night sweats. I started having uh, problems with my concentration. I had tinnitus. I had all these problems. I just felt horrible. And I didn't, what I didn't realize is that I had a, a cancerous tumor in my body that was wrapped around my optic nerve, wrapped around my ear canal, wrapped around my throat and my chest, wrapped around my cardiothoracic system, wrapped around my cerebral cortex, my feet, my legs, and my arms. And I've been carrying this weight my entire life. And then I'm at primal advantage and I'm going to Plug her business now. Uh, her website is primaladvantage.net. I'm going to post a link to her website now in the chat so everyone can check it out. I had a dream that I met this woman in 2017. I just saw an image of her face, and she was holding my hand and looked back at me, smiling ear to ear, beaming with glory, uh, long red curly hair, and... Uh, 
And she said, Christopher, let's go to the bluff. And she held both of my hands and then the image stops. And I'm like, who on earth is that? Who is that? And then I was like, okay, it's nobody I know. So I'm like, okay, that's a nice dream. If I, if I recognize her, I'll definitely point it out. But I had to keep it to myself for a while. And um, I found her face in Ramiro Armani's Neo Network. And I'm like, and my jaw dropped. And I and I and my jaw dropped for half an hour and I couldn't move. And I was just fixated on this woman's face. I was like, is this really happening right now? I was like, okay, stay calm. And then I look at everything, you know, I look at crypto, I look at health, I look at all these synergies. It's like this woman is on the same path as me. I need to reach out to her. And this dream is clearly, has clearly prepared me for this moment. So I reached out to her and I told her about decentralized domains because I uh, knew that people of conscience were going to be targeted no matter how large or small their businesses were. So I, I put that information forward. I started building a trusting relationship with Primal Advantage. And she returned my trust very graciously by uh, hanging out with me, going hiking with me, and spending time with me on more than one occasion. Uh, I live about a five-hour drive from her. So it's uh, we don't get to see each other as often as I would like, but that's okay. Um, it was just really wonderful because here I was in the worst state of my life and needing friendship and needing camaraderie, wasn't really sure what direction was going to go. You know, just, it was just nice to hang out with, with her because, you know, it was safe and there was, um, kind of a domestic situation that was stable and in my life. And, you know, because I, it was just me and the cat and I didn't really have a lot of drama. It was just good to meet and have a new friend. You know, it was good to have a new friend at the time. And, um, and eventually, really tumultuous times came to our life in late 2021. My cat was killed, was run over by a car on August 1st. And she was there for me every step of the way. I was despondent for about a month. And after I came out of it, I wrote a song. I, I just told her, it's like, I want to write a song for you because she was struggling. And so was I. And she wanted something beautiful. And I struggled to create something beautiful because I was in such despair, you know? But I did it and I built it out about an 11 minute long tune that I've shared with Matt, I've shared with her and I've shared with just about everything, everyone I know, including my clients and their jaws dropped. They couldn't believe how good it sounded. And I was like, I still got it. You know, even in this degraded state of health, I still have it. I'm still holding on to light. My health continued worsening. Lesions continued appearing on my legs and all over my body. And I didn't know what I was going to do. So I started using Rick Simpson oil, a future business partner reached out to me and said, Chris, I'm going to give you 15 grams of free Rick Simpson oil. Start taking it. And I was like, okay, I feel better, but I'm still sick. And then I ordered more and I kept taking more. And I still felt sick and I started drinking chaga tea and I was still sick and I was getting worse and worse. And Primal Advantage offered me some Reiki. And I was like, I've got to do something. I've got to reach out to, to the gods and to the universe and open my heart to this energy and open my heart to her and trust her after not trusting women of any kind my entire life because my life depends on it and if I'm going to be on the put myself on the line for her and she's going to return the favor that I need to honor that so I did and I was overjoyed because you know, she had cleared through so much trauma that she was still working through and still had the heart to reach back out. And that's such a wonderful, wonderful connection to have with another human being, especially someone you admire, trust, and love so much. And we just had simple a simple gathering, shopping, groceries. I just ordered grapes because I was doing a grape fast and decided to break the fast. I have some of her wonderful cooking that she posts to her channel. And then we had Reiki. And that's when everything changed for me. The entire le right left side of my body went numb. I felt a glowing light in my sacral region in the exact spot where my pain was the worst. And she looked at me and clasped her hands together. And we shared a moment uh, that was very profound. I 
the tears just flew out and flew out of me. I didn't know why they just came out. I wasn't really emotionally feeling anything. They just came out because pressure points were released. That I'm still, you know, letting go. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, on March 7th, just to, less than two weeks after that session took place. <laughs> I was having a good day on March 7th. I was chatting. I was doing my day-to-day -day thing. I was doing my research. And I went to go lay down in bed. And uh, I was getting ready to go to sleep. And then suddenly my heart rate jumped 100 beats a minute. Tinnitus was so loud I couldn't hear. My chest seized and I couldn't take a breath. My lung capacity was about one second. And I was hyperventilating. So I took six grams of N-acetyl cysteine that I had stocked up on a five-year supply on. It's a damn good thing I did that. And I waited 10 minutes and I was okay. And I took a breath and I laid back down. And suddenly my entire body convulsed and I saw the image of a hydra with its head centered at my root chakra and tentacles extending up and down from head to toe. And I couldn't see its face. It didn't say anything. And I screamed at it and I said, universe, deliver me from this evil spirit. I want it banished from my body. And I said, you know, I'm not going to use your name. Uh, Primal Advantage Cosmos, Cosmic Support System, uh, friends and family here and departed. And any entities in this room, grant me the power to banish it once and for all. And I took a breath. And I had this tool, electrocautery tool. And, I, and it was pure panic. I didn't know what else to do. I wasn't thinking it through. I placed the electrocautery tool on one of my lymph nodes in my sacral region, and I pressed my finger up against the opposite side of it, and I screamed in extre extreme excruciating pain. No one was in the house, fortunately. They were all on a party somewhere else, but uh, I live in an intentional community, and people live upstairs from me, and uh, they know what I'm going through. So after two hours of running this current through my body, my entire left arm felt like I had touched a... Uh, you know, a hot electrical wire, but I was okay. I just couldn't feel anything. So I had to take a breath and I made myself a cup of tea because I could at least move around. And uh, the anesthesia cysteine had brought down my blood pressure. And after I sat back down, I put my hand on my arm and I realized that I felt an electrical current pulling all the tumors toward my hand. And I was like, oh my God. And I took my hand and I placed it in my sacral region and immediately started disintegrating tumors. And as these tumors disintegrated, I had flashes of light. I had flashbacks starting from 2022, dating back to 1990, one after the other, pop, 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 pop. And that's when I realized that this disease isn't naturally occurring. It harvests your dreams. It harvests your memories. It harvests your energy. It harvests your hormonal output. It harvests your food intake. All of my cravings, all the things that I desire to eat, whether it's a nice bowl of pasta or a big meal of sushi or a, a nice big plate of, uh, you know, uh, you know, bangers and mash, you know, everything I was eating was, I was under the influence of this disease, even though I thought I was eating well, I was just eating and pounding and stuffing my face because I was constantly hungry all the time. And I was hungry all the time because I had cancer of pretty much every single organ fortunately it did not extend past my lymph nodes my lymph nodes were containing it but they were on the brink of being overrun and i was just popping off one day after another pop 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 and uh eventually my skin on my legs you know i, I was as of right now i've cleared a large number of tumors from my brain uh, I, I placed my head on my face ladies and gentlemen okay and i felt a tumor in my optic nerve unravel in real time. And I had more blood flow and I could feel my body is sinking into the bed, almost like I was sinking into quicksand. It was my body slowly re-expanding after years and years and years, decades of not being able to fully extend my own body. I was a prisoner in my own body. I was a prisoner in my own mind. I was a prisoner of the state. I was a prisoner of my emotions and my story. And I wanted out. It took almost dying to get out. That was March 7th was when Mars and Venus exited Capricorn. It was an astrological portal that I passed through. And Primal Advantage also passed through one, but I'm not going to mention when that date is. So we were both going through the same 
purging away of extreme emotions. And that connection won my heart, my loyalty, and my honor forever. Ladies and gentlemen of the crypto community, Primal Advantage saved my life. I'm only able to make this presentation today. Is The only reason I was able to make it is because I went to that Reiki session. She saved my life, and I will stand up for her for the rest of my days. And this is a testimonial as much as it is a call to action. Many people within this community are hurting. Many people in this community don't know where to turn. Many people in this community are just going balls to the wall trying to save the world while they're not saving themselves. They're not, they don't know how to heal themselves because they don't have a guide. Mark my words, ladies and gentlemen, Primal Advantage will be remembered in history as one of the greatest healers to have ever lived. This business opportunity with Primal Advantage, with Reiki, or with personal health coaching will get you on the path to health so you can stay sharp with your trading, stay sharp with your love life, stay sharp with your friends, stay sharp with your food intake and your self-care. Everyone can improve their self-care. And... If you go to Primal Vantage's website and look at her offering, she has a Reiki offering. It is a distance Reiki offering, but if her in-person Reiki offering is in any way compatible to it, which I know it is, and there is no if about it because I've uh, known the results from others that have received it, it will be the greatest healing journey and the most profound experience of your life. I promise. And if you're going to do business with me on what I'm about to pitch, do business with her first because she is basically, you know, she's literally my violet flame by definition. She's my same old fire by definition. And I'm proud to call her my best friend and my, my creative muse and everything that I've ever dreamed for. And in a friend and in a woman, she is the embodiment of the divine feminine and it's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. And she's so humble. It's all from the vine. And she's just a channel. And she's, she's, she's right. She's right. But not everybody can channel this energy. Not everybody has that ability. It is something that you have to work for. It's something that you have to learn and something you have to dedicate yourself towards. It's something that you have to put as a priority above other things. And health comes before crypto. I put crypto before health because I didn't realize how bad it was. And a miracle saved my life ladies and gentlemen my resting heart rate is i average was averaging 72 beats a minute it's now 45. i can stand up straight for the first time in my life i can touch my toes and even grab the backs of my heels without restriction for the first time in my life i was gonna die ladies and gentlemen i had spinal lymphoma brain tumors thyroid tumors prostate tumors tumors in my kneecaps my elbows everywhere large majority of them are gone i'm still working through them and I'm still taking SEAC tea and other aspects of, uh, of healing, as well as Rick Simpson oil. So that, that's my health journey. That's my health journey. And uh, that's where I am today. And I expect that within the next one to two years that not only will I regain peak performance, I expect to get that back at some point this year, uh, perhaps late in the summer. Uh, but I expect my recovery from cancer in terms of the protocols I'm going to stick with for at least the next 12 months and that is how i'm going to approach my recovery and if anybody has any questions about how how i did this you know feel free to ask but what i did was i utilized the principle there, there's a synthesis principle of sound design called hard oscillator synchronization and another one called input doubling when in, in the analog synthesis and whenever you're using hard oscillator synchronization, what you're doing is you have two, uh, you have two oscillators. One of the oscillators is a, is a, um, an oscillator, which is self self-defining. It is a uh, waveform that moves in the sound spectrum. And the other one is a carrier that modulates it. When you do a hard oscillator sync, the carrier waveform synchronizes with the uh, os the, the uh, oscillator input waveform it, it, it specifically with its fundamental frequency and whenever you have fundamental frequency alignment the pitches match uh, from a musical standpoint and if you shift the frequency on the carrier oscillator you will get harmonic and harmonic overtones and undertones that you can then dial in to create 
uh, different types of uh, pitch characteristics, you know, spread out chords and things that you couldn't normally do with a, a monophonic instrument. And then in the final part of that, you have the output path. So when I reverse engineered how I uh, imbued my body with this electrical energy, I uh, utilized uh, electrical engineering principles to understand that. So in this case, the oscillator was a tool called the ward abater. It's an electric cautery tool used to remove minor skin imperfections. The carrier was a tumor and the output path was my hand and the rest of my body. Okay. That's, that's the first part of the link up. Well, what's the next part? Okay. How, how, how does the, how does the cancer get destroyed? Okay. So in my case, the input waveform was negatively charged. It was of negative polarity and it was a square wave. Okay, and a square wave is, uh, it looks like a square. It's got uh, sharp peaks and sharp drop-offs. And I combined the square wave with the frequency of the cancer. And it, when you, whenever you uh, reverse that uh, waveform, when, whenever you invert a waveform and, uh, and place them side by side in any synthesis situation, it, the, the, the sound cancels itself out. And the canceling out phase is what's called input doubling. So I take the output and I place it back into the carrier wave by touching my finger to that lesion. And that is what completes what's called dub, uh, input doubling. And with that input doubling, uh, I can actually use a force multiplier, which is applying more pressure that will actually amplify the signal in the same way that turning up the volume would. And the experiment was successful and it immediately destroyed these tumors. And, sa and I saved my own life by alchemical synergy and uh, some some divine intervention so yeah that's how i survived ladies and gentlemen um moving on to my businesses um so what have i done you know i've, I've spent the, the last hour ago go ahead matt, matt. So I, I had a question you said you were able to hear yourself with with a sound a unique sound frequency you created no, it's not a sound frequency. I, I was using that as an example because I was reverse engineering the process to gain an understanding of how it could have worked. And whenever I uh, looked at input doubling and hard oscillator sync and phase cancellation, that made sense. Because if you're trying to imbue an energy field, any any carrier, the human body is electrical. You know, uh, the, the human body has always been electrical. And if you're able to safely put in an electrical current that's not going to hurt you, which is what the water debater is capable of doing, then you do it. And since I wasn't touching it directly, I was just getting the current fed in. And uh, I was getting two different signals that were being synchronized and uh, summed together. And it was, I mean, I got to talk to Foster Gamble or somebody about this because there are already uh, uh, sound wave types of uh, sound wave healing uh, apparatuses like the Rife machine that's capable of destroying uh, cancer tumors by using sound waves. Could you so, run could you run Rick Simpson oil or a cannabis strain through it? And would that no, that that, that 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 you could do that, but um I, I wouldn't attempt to because if you heat Rick Simpson oil, it destroys the terpenes. Okay. So um I'm I'm not saying that would negate the effects, but it's an interesting uh yeah uh, yeah, get <laughs> doorknob. That's that's kind of it. You know, it's like I got this, uh, but you know, this purported superpower, and uh, yeah, I don't want to over advertise this concept. But uh, you know, when it, in terms of explaining it, that doesn't make sense. And that's that that was the reverse engineering logic I used to describe how it worked. I don't know how it actually worked because I'm not an electrical engineer, I'm not an engineer per se. So uh, I'd be interested to hear what actual scientists would say about my discovery. Hey, we got some background noise. Yeah, I'm just gonna, okay, I'm just gonna eat this one here. Okay. Um. Okay. So moving on to my business ventures, uh, I have I have a few. Um, not very many at this time. I'm just uh, I've just gotten started with a few of them. But uh, my primary business venture is a uh, a private client group style hedge fund for a uh, cryptocurrency investment. It's a uh, cryptocurrency portfolio management business. I don't have a website. I'm not advertising this to the general public. And uh, yeah, doorknob means murdered. Yeah, that's exactly what it means. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I did it at the encouragement of a friend. 
uh, in the crypto space who uh, gave me my first bit of investment. And uh, he cashed out at the top of the market in November, took his profits and said thanks. And he was having some personal issues. So he had to kind of withdraw for a minute, but we're still in, in contact. And then he introduced me to my first batch of clients and uh, I onboarded them and I took my fee and I started managing the portfolios. Um, in terms of the asset classes that I like to put together, it's usually a mixture of uh, privacy assets and transparent assets. And the way that I'm constructing portfolios now is 50% staking for passive income and 50% speculative. Um, I don't want to trade everything. I like to see smaller entry points and I like investors that are in it for the long haul that can just kind of continuously cash out profits as they come in. Um, I don't personally do a lot of short term trading and investing unless a client wants me to, but it is something I'm going to be adding to my business plan. Uh, future onboardings will have 10% of the stack or the initial investment uh, that will go into a trading pool. And I will use that to basically cut my teeth into the trading, getting in, getting out and adding some short term profits to offset losses from other things and uh, either reinvesting them, putting them into stable coins or just dropping them into Monero because stacking Monero is important. Even if you're just investing for uh, periodic uh, cash outs or if you're hodling or things of this nature, but I, I don't make money unless I trade. So my fee is 10% of the initial investment and 10% of every trade. And I don't trade much for that reason it's because I don't want to reduce the initial investment and, miss out on being able to cash out those profits. So, and uh, you know, not, not that I'm hanging myself there, but uh, that's how I like to, to do things. I'm, I'm a little bit more old school. I don't like to, you know, rush out of investments so they crash a lot. I know the crypto cryptocurrency market is volatile. I've taken a lot of the recommendations of projects I received from fractal intelligence, from individuals within here, as well as research I've done on my own. And for those of you that have or haven't been paying attention to the channel much these days, I wanted to give you guys an exclusive a uh, piece of a uh, bit of information on a on an altcoin that I'm extraordinarily bullish on, and it's uh, uh it's Thor Chain. Most of you are familiar with Thor Chain, but we have a problem, ladies and gentlemen. We have a problem with centralized exchanges. We've got a problem with financial censorship, and we've got a problem with censorship in general. And we need decentralized solutions to solve this problem. Thor Thor Chain has tr a, a tremendous website. It is what a it's, it's what an exchange experience needs to be. You go there, you can create a key store file, you can link up your uh, hardware wallet, whether it's a ledger or something else. I personally like to use a key store file because I use a USB stick because I don't particularly like the security profile of, a, of, of, of ledger's hardware wallets. I don't think that they're secure in my personal opinion. And if I can use a key store file, I'm technically competent enough to access those. So I create a key store file, I drop it on an encrypted USB stick and I access it. I don't need 2FA. I don't need any, you know, personally identifiable information or, or I don't need to show, I, I don't need to show and exchange my ass to pass KYC, you know, and uh, Rune. Yeah, Rune is the ticker symbol. Um, here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen, you want to own a piece of decentralized exchanges. And the reason why you want to own that is because it's going to be the functional equivalent of owning Binance or Coinbase in the future. And these tokens are going to be massively more valuable than those because people are going to jump ship from the centralized exchanges when they follow Satan Klaus's orders. When when Anus Rob starts to it comes to cornhole your finances, you don't want that to happen to you. So um, it's not just about owning the the the, uh, the token; it's about utilizing the site. Okay. If you like a project, it's good to invest in it. If you know that a project has value and merit, you invest in it. And decentralized exchanges today will be the standard in the future. My thoughts on KuCoin, my thoughts on KuCoin are more geopolitical than they are practical. And the reason I say this is because in my geopolitical analysis, I see uh, Singapore, where KuCoin is based, as a mediator between East and West because the Iron Curtain has been re-erected and it's been re-erected in reverse in a very short space of time this year. And the Russophobia that was so prevalent in the 1980s that many people on this phone call weren't alive to experience has come back in spades. And this is worse, far worse than the Russophobia that I saw in the mid 1980s or when Perestroika was coming around or or even during the 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 heyday of the anti-communist uprisings, especially in, the, in Romania in 1989, uh, which was a very interesting experience for me to watch. Uh, and for those of you that aren't familiar with the uh, with the Romanian Revolution, 
the what happened was in Romania at the time, gasoline was rationed to two gallons a month. Uh, electricity was cut off for months out of the year. Most people didn't even have functional plumbing or toilets. You know, they were basically living like farm animals, you know, uh, quite literally. And eventually people had had enough. And within the religious community, uh, an underground resistance was formed. And what they did was they started to protest. And then the regime started turning their guns on the people and the army joined them, but the Securitate did not. The Securitate was the, uh, was the, basically the, the Romanian branch of the KGB. And uh, every single member of the Securitate, uh, whether it was in uh, Timisoara or in Bucharesti, were uh, cataloged and their addresses were put down, their phone numbers were put down. And where they traveled to on a daily basis, their locations, plenty of recon was done on these folks. And then uh, between the months of uh, August and December of 1989, you know, Parabellum Sacrum was declared.